Hello everybody, welcome back to another video. This video is going to be a continuation from the previous one. So if you haven't seen the previous one, I would recommend you to go and watch it. In this video, I'm going to continue on with the homo different homologous series or families of organic molecules that I discussed in the previous video. So this is the next part. Um, let's get into it. So the very first homologous series or family that I'm going to look at is carboxylic acids. Now carboxylic acids are defined by or are defined by this particular group over here. It's called the carboxyl group. So the carboxyl group looks something like this. So this is its functional group. What is a functional group? So in this column over here, in this, in this column over here, they have showed you the functional groups of each of these families. And the functional group gives that element or that molecule its identity. It tells you that it belongs to a particular family. And there can be many different types of organic molecules in a particular family. And they all contain these functional groups, all of them, every single one of them. They may be a bit different from each other, but at the end of the day, they all contain these functional groups. And the functional group, like I said, is kind of the identity giver. And it is also the reactive part of the molecule. So every all the reactions that occur mostly happen with the functional group. In this column, they've given us the names of the functional group. Um, in this, they've given us an example of organic molecules with the particular functional group they're talking about. They've given us how to name these organic compounds which contain these functional groups. And last but not least, they have given us an example. So this example is basically corresponding to the um, figure they have given over here. So this figure is actually propanoic acid and that's why they've told us propanoic acid. This is 2-bromobutane. Two two so they've told us it's 2-bromobutane. You get the idea. Now, carboxylic acids are very important. They are found everywhere. Um, there's a lot of it in IV chemistry. Many questions involve carboxylic acids and reactions with them. And I'll show you one of them in this video itself. Now, any organic molecule with this group, it's often referred to as the Ku group. If you study biology, you know what this means. You've probably come across it a lot. This is referred to as the Ku group. And if a molecule has this Ku group, then you can be rest assured that it is a carboxylic acid. Now, there are a few exceptions to that. If it only has the Ku group, then you can be sure that it's a carboxylic acid. There are a um, few exceptions, but we don't need to know about that, or about those in the IB. Just remember that if you see this functional group on an organic molecule, then it's a carboxylic acid. Now, how do you name carboxylic acids? It's very simple. The first thing you need to do is count the number of carbons that are in the compound. And this doesn't mean all of them. And what I mean by that is these names that we give to these compounds are based on IUPAC rules. And I've discussed IUPAC rules in another video. So please go and check that out. But to give you a brief summary, we count the number of carbons in the longest possible chain, longest possible carbon chain in that molecule. And I know if you are confused about this, please again, go and check out my previous video. I explain everything in that and I make it much clearer. So you first count the number of carbons in the longest possible carbon chain in that organic molecule. So I'm just gonna take this example over here. I'm just gonna draw it a bit bigger. Oops. All right, so in this molecule, we can see that the longest possible carbon chain is one, two, three. So it's made up of three carbons. That would mean that it's prefix would be prop, right? Now, if you want to name a molecule, which is a carboxylic acid, you have to, like I said, first 
find the number of carbons, which we have done. It's the, the, num the number of carbons in the longest carbon chain is three carbons. Then we know the prefix. And for supposing it's something like three carbons, it would be propanoic acid. If it is four carbons, so if it looks something like this, if it looks something like this, then it'd be one, two, three, that's four carbons, and it would become butanoic acid. If it was If it was just two carbons, then it would be ethanoic acid. And ethanoic acid, as you may know, is found abundantly in vinegar. So you can see one of its applications there. Hopefully you get the idea of what I mean and how to name them. It's very easy. The next homologous series we're going to be looking at are the halogenoalkanes. The halogenoalkanes, as you can probably tell by the name, are just alkanes, but they contain a halogen in them. Now, how do alkanes become into halogenoalkanes? Well, that is a story that is for another day. Um, we're not going to cover that over here. But halogenoalkanes are basically alkanes, but they have a halogen connected to a carbon in them. So alkanes, as I mentioned in the previous video, are very unreactive. They look like this. Only hydrogens and carbons don't have a particular functional group. And halogenoalkanes are exactly the same. Sorry. Halogenoalkanes are exactly the same, but one of their carbons, instead of having a hydrogen attached to it, it has a halogen attached to it. And then you get a halogen alkane. It could be any halogen. It could be bromine. It could be chlorine. It could be fluorine. It could be iodine. It doesn't matter. And the position of the halogen alkane can be anywhere. It can be on the first carbon. It can be on the second carbon. It can be on the third carbon. It doesn't matter. Now, how do you name these guys? Well, the first thing you have to do is you have to identify what type of halogen is in the organic molecule. And if supposing, if it's bromine, then the abbreviation that we use of to, to identify a bromine in an organic molecule is bromo. So you would write bromobutane. If it contains four carbons. In our case, it has three carbons, so we would write bromopropane. It is the name of the halogen with this format. You can't write bromine propane, that's wrong. You have to write bromopropane and followed by the name of the alkane. So since it has three carbons, it would be propane. If it had four, it would be butane. If it had two, it would be ethane. But then you're not done there. You have to also do one more thing. You have to identify the position of the halogen or the bromine in the molecule. So in this case, the bromine is on the second carbon, right? It doesn't matter which direction you count it from. In both ways, it will be the second carbon. So you have to write two bromopropane. If supposing the bromine was here, then it would just be bromopropane or you could write one bromopropane. It would not be three bromopropane. If you think you can count from left to right, so if you number this one, two, three, that would be wrong. The IUPAC rules state that the carbon with the functional group attached to it, and this the functional group is the halogen. So the carbon with the functional group attached to it has to have the lowest number that are the rules. So you should make sure you remember that. So look out for where the bromine is or the halogen is. It could be bromine. It could be chlorine. If it's chlorine, it would become chloropropane. If it is iodine, it would become iodopropane. If it is fluorine, it would become fluoropropane. 
even though I have never seen this come up, but just in case you want to know. So yeah, that's it for halogen oil games. Very easy. The next one are amines. Now amines, I've, I've actually never seen them come up in the exam, but that's not to say that they can't, they can, but I've never seen them. All you need to know is that amines involve nitrogen, right? So nitrogen can be attached to two hydrogens. They have, amines can be a variety. Amines can have, diff, you can have different functional groups and still be considered an amine. So this is a more inclusive family. You could think of it like that. Your functional group could be this. Your functional group could be this. Now this R, what is R? R is anything. R is a variable. It can be anything. Anything can be attached to nitrogen. Anything permissible, of course, right? Um, oops, sorry, I made a mistake over here. Yeah, so anything permissible can be attached to nitrogen. Now, the next one is N, R, R. Anything can be attached, again, variables. Doesn't have to be a hydrogen, it can be anything else. And in this spot over here, the stop spot, this is where nitrogen attaches itself to the rest of the organic molecule. And I'll show you what I mean by that. So in amino acids, if you've heard from, if you take biology, if you, if you take biology, you should know about this. So um, amino acids, are called amino acids because you find an amine group in them. The name of the functional group of amines is called amino. Amine is the name of the homologous series or the family, and amino is the name of the functional group that you find in the amine homologous series. So amino acids contain amino groups. Now, how do you name an amino? Uh, sorry, how do you name an amine? Well, you first take a look at the organic molecule. Imagine you have, um, let's see, if you have a compound that looks like this. So as you can see, we have an amino group here. It's an amino group. And then this whole molecule automatically becomes an amine. But how do you name it? Well, it's the same process as the others. The first thing you do is count the number of carbons in the longest possible carbon chain. Well, as we can see, there is only two carbons. So the longest possible chain is made up of two carbons. That would mean that it would be an ethyl amine. And you can see over here how you name it. You first identify the prefix. If it's eth, if it's two, if it's eth, if it's one, it's myth. If it is three, it's prop. If it's four, it's but. And then you add an ile amine at the end of it. So ethylamine. If the longest possible carbon chain is three, propylamine. If it's four, butylamine. If it's five, pentylamine, so on and so forth. You get the idea. Now the next homology series or family. The next one is esters. Now esters are a special family, right? Esters are actually made up from two other different families that we have discussed. And I've told you about this at the start of the video. And that is about, that is when I was talking about carboxylic acids. I said carboxylic, carboxylic acids are very important. They come up in a lot of other reactions, and this is one of them. Carboxylic acids, I'm going to denote them by the Ku group because carboxylic acids contain the Ku group. When combined with alcohols, which have the hydroxyl group, they give you esters. So what are the use of esters? Well, esters are used very widely. Um, the perfumes that you use, that fruity fragrance that you get from the perfume, that is all because of esters. 
Esters are the reason why you get that smell. So they're very important, a lot of commercial value in them. They're used industrially as well in a lot of places. So that's some useful knowledge for you. Um, but how exactly are esters formed and how do you identify them if you are given one? Well, imagine you have an alcohol. Imagine we have, um, let's just imagine we have methanol, okay? So this is methanol. And we have a carboxylic acid, um, ethanol. No, sorry, um, ethanoic acid, not ethanol, my bad. So our carboxylic acid is ethanoic acid. So this is ethanoic acid. Now, what is going to happen here? Let me tell you. When these two meet up with each other, when these two meet up with each other, the hydroxyl group from the alcohol is going to combine with this one hydrogen on the hydroxyl group of the acid. It's going to combine with this and it's going to form water, H2O. It's going to form water, H2O. And now this, these broken bridges are going to be connected again using this oxygen bridge over here. You can think of it like an oxygen bridge. So there you go. This is an ester. You saw earlier, the earlier, the earlier picture looked, looked something like this. These two, were, these two were separate from one another. The OH group from the alcohol combined with the hydrogen of the two group in the acid to form water. So this was removed. It formed H2O and the oxygen was used to create a bridge. And how do you identify this particular functional group? Well, just look for this, this particular functional group. This is what denotes an ester. And as you can see over here, that is what they have said as well. Now, how do you name esters? How do you name them? The first, if you're, if you're given an ester like this, the first thing you want to do is you want to look at the element or the alcohol actually. You wanna look at the alcohol. In this case, the alcohol is this, this is the alcohol. And the alcohol was methanol. So this, this name goes first, so it would become methyl. Then you look at what carboxylic acid was used. As you can see, the carboxylic acid that was used was ethanoic acid. So it would become ethanoate. So the name of this ester is methyl ethanoate. First, look at left, then look at right and follow the structure, this method of naming them. Hopefully you understood that. Next, we move on to this function group, which doesn't have a name, weirdly. Um, sorry, this homologous series, it doesn't have a name. For some reason, it just says A over there. I don't know why, but the function group of this um, homologous series is nitrile. So I've actually never seen nitrile come up in an exam, never. Um, nobody's ever asked me questions. They don't really have a significance in um, the rest of the syllabus either. I don't really see them come up anywhere. But nonetheless, it's good to know about them. The functional group in a nitrile is a carbon triple bonded to a nitrogen. So if you see this carbon triple bonded to a nitrogen, then you know it's a nitrile um, functional group. How do you name nitrile? Well, it's just the alkane and you add nitrile to the end. So you look at the longest possible carbon chain in the molecule. In this case, it's three carbons. Also count the carbon, which is in the functional group. Always count it. This carbon is a part of the functional group. And still, you have to count it in the longest possible carbon chain. Don't forget that. It's also mentioned over here. So then this would, since it's three carbons, the longest possible chain, it would become propane nitrile. 
That's it. Very simple. Just keep an eye out for this carbon triple bonded to nitrogen. The next function group is amide. Again, I have never seen amide come up in an exam, never, um, but still I'm going to go through it. The function group for amide is this. It's sort of like a carboxylic acid, but with a nitrogen or a amine group, sorry, an amino group instead of a hydroxyl group. So carboxylic acids are like this. How are amide groups, sorry, um, amides are like this. So yeah, now the func this functional group, this particular functional group um, for carboxylic acids, this was called carboxyl. For amides, it was co it's called carbox amide. That is the name of the functional group. Now, if you see this in a compound and if you want to name it, again, very, very simple, count the carbon, the longest possible carbon chain, include the carbon which is a part of the functional group, include that. So it's three carbons. And that would mean that it is a prop, it would be a prop organic molecule. So it would be propan amide if it has three carbons. If it has only two carbons like this, supposing it's like this, then it would be it would be ethanol, it would be ethan amide. If it has if it has just one carbon, then it would be methan amide. If it has four, it would be butan amide. Hopefully that makes sense. So that's it for this video. That's all the organic molecules that you need to know for IV chemistry. That's all of it. Um, I know it's a lot of information to digest. Always keep this table with you. Take a photo of it, take a screenshot. I'll just erase this if you want to do that. Um, it's very, very useful. A few people reached out to me asking me where they could get this table. And I told them that it is in the IB chemistry textbook that I have. I have an online version. If you would like to see it, very, very helpful textbook, reach out to me. I'll send you a link to the Google Drive and you can access it over there. Thank you so much for watching. If you have any other questions regarding this concept, please feel free to let me know on my social media, on my email, in the comments, and I'll be more than happy to help you. Thanks a lot. Take care, everyone. And I'll see you in another video with another question.